Wow. So I want to talk about how following an anointed person will make you unshakable. Because our theme this year is that we are supposed to be unshakable, isn't it? So I want to teach you about how following an anointed person will make you unshakable. I'm hoping in the afternoon we can get a time to maybe hear from some of you, but also spend some time in prayer as well. And just trust God for impartation. But I also thank God because impartation is already happening. In fact, I suspect what will be happening is also we'll be hearing testimonies of what God has already done. Uh, he's already done it. If you've been feeling healing, don't doubt it, by the way. Just accept it. Yeah, you know, there's some of you who've been feeling like you're healed, but you're not sure. You're like, let me give this another week. No, no, no. Proclaim it. Accept it. Declare it. It is done in Jesus' name. It's done in Jesus' name. So we'll be hearing some testimonies as well. But I want to talk about how following an anointed person will make you unshakable. When God gave me that theme, unshakable, you know, sometimes you have to read through what God is telling you. If someone tells you you need to be unshakable, if you're really smart, you'll start thinking and meditating on that word. Why would you tell me to be unshakable unless there's a shaking coming? That, that was kind of my thought process. I was like, why would God want us to be unshakable unless there's a reason that a shaking is coming and that God's people are going to have to resist the shaking that is coming? I just don't know why. I don't know when. But I do know and I fully believe a shaking is coming. I don't think it's going to happen to Mavuno. I think it's going to be a global shaking. This is now my, it's not God who has said this, but this is just my sense. I sense there's a shaking that's going to happen. I sense the world is about to transition. You know, there are generations that experience transitions. And it's always interesting why it happens to some generations and not others. There are some generations that were born and they died in the same kind of epoch. And then there are generations that transition. So like in the world war, there was a generation that knew peace, and then there are the ones who went through a war. And the world changed. And they grew up in one epoch, and they moved into a different one. You know, we're the generation that saw COVID. The generations before us had never seen something like that. I mean, apart from the ones who were in their living memory. And so it was our generation that saw that. But I believe that was just the first of many shakings and that there are things that are going to come that will shake this world. But I believe the Lord wants us to be prepared for that because he wants his people to be unshakable. These are difficult times that may already be with us or maybe they are coming. I don't even know. I don't have clarity on that. All I know is that we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared spiritually. We need to be prepared financially. We need to be prepared so that when everybody else is shaking, God's people are advancing. I believe that's what God wants us to do. And that's why you hear me giving a lot of instructions on money. Our June series is going to be a money series. We're going to be talking kingdom finance. And the reason is because God wants us to be unshakable financially in that time. And so the one thing I know is God gave me a scripture, Psalm 144 verse 1. Praise be to the Lord my rock. Who? Trains my hands for war. My fingers for battle. I believe God is training our hands for war. And when you're trained, you have nothing to be afraid, isn't it? This is the Lord that we serve. He prepares his people. And this is a season of preparation for Mavuno Church. So that's one of the reasons we're talking about anointing. We say that anointing is the Holy Spirit's power to fulfill your divine assignment. And as we learned yesterday, it's mostly passed on through others. There's no place that says it can only be passed on that way. But the testimony of Scripture is that it's mostly passed on from one person to another. One of the things I've come to see is that anointing is a form of spirit. It's like a form of spiritual inheritance. Just like there's physical inheritance in families. And I've noticed as well that anointing typically operates like physical inheritance as well. Spiritual inheritance operates like physical inheritance. That... You know, sometimes, once in a while, you find somebody who dies, a patriarch, and leaves an inheritance for his children, and then leaves an inheritance for the grandchildren as well. It's like the grandchildren are there as well, and they're given their portion as well. And if they're great-grandchildren, they're also given their portion. Very rarely. I've known very few hand cases of that. Usually what happens 
is that inheritance is passed on to the children who then in turn steward it and pass it on or are meant to pass it on to their children as well, isn't it? So in the family, that order is important. And I say this because whenever we talk about anointing, it's important to know that the anointing of the house also usually follows order. That your campus pastor may not be the person you consider very anointed. <laughs> Maybe they're young. Maybe they don't have as much education. Maybe they're single, whatever it is. But God has an order. And many times what happens is God will pass the anointing of the house through the person in the house he's put you in charge, who's put in charge of you. So why did God put you in that discipleship group under that discipleship? And you know, I want you to understand, even as you listen to my talks, you need to be listening to them from the perspective of the one receiving anointing, but also the one transmitting anointing. Every one of you. It's very easy for you to just be in that perspective of, I want to receive, but not understand I'm also a conduit of that that I receive. So within the church, you're going to find that there are people who spend time when Pastor Kelonzi spends time with his leaders, he spends a lot more time with his leaders who are discipleship group leaders than he does with you who's not in the discipleship group leadership system. And that there's an anointing that is going to be passed on through that leader, not their own, but something that was transmitted to them to transmit to you. Does that make sense? So these are some of the truths about anointing that are really important for us. I know I want to follow Pastor M, but I don't like my network pastor. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Um, it really is, you know, in an army, you don't decide, I like the commander in chief, but I can't salute the sergeant. That's court martialable. You can find yourself in serious trouble. And it's the same way when it comes to spiritual inheritance. There's an order in which anointing follows. Let me, let me, let me just talk about levels of following. Because you can be following someone at different levels. There's different levels of following that open you up to the, to the anointing. Before I talk about how it's going to make you unshakable. You know, God will give you a spiritual family for spiritual inheritance, but not everybody is positioned for that inheritance. Not everybody is given responsibility over the inheritance. Usually when the patriarch passes on, there should be an order. Maybe the firstborn should be the executor of the will. But you know there are families where it's given to the lastborn. Have you guys ever seen that? Yeah, because the firstborn was not prepared. And so the, the order jumped and was given to the responsible one who was ready. It's the same way with spiritual inheritance. There are different levels of receptivity to anointing. You can be in the same church, but you receive it differently. You receive it differently from others. Jesus taught crowds, but at the end of the day, they, he only had 120 left by the time the Holy Spirit was falling upon that room. He had taught 5,000 and fed them. 5,000 divided by 120. How many? <laughs> have you ever tried to do that much? Like what happened to all those other ones? Yet they ate the food. They were there for the ministry. But when the time of inheritance and apportioning of the anointing came, they were nowhere in that room. They were not among the elected ones to be in that room. So there are reasons why this happens, and it's because of the levels of anointing. There are some levels of impact that your leader's anointing can have on you. The first one, is that they have no impact. <laughs> Your leader has no impact of anointing on you. You've been with that person, you've listened to them, you've heard their messages, you've sat under their ministry, but it really had no impact on you. Maybe you didn't think they were really worthy of passing on something to you, like the people in Jesus' town. They had his messages, but they didn't receive anything from him because they despised him. Maybe the leader offended you. Maybe you thought they were not qualified. You treated them like a good person, and so you got a good person's reward. Maybe it just didn't make sense. Have you ever known people who've gone to church for years and has not changed them? Yeah? Like they've gone to church for years, and they're known as church people, but there's no, there's no power in their lives. They're no different. I know you've all seen people like those. And that's a level where you're just hearing the message, but it's not having any impact. The anointing is not being transmitted. Level two, they inspire you. They inspire you. You've been with a person, and you realize that God really speaks to you when they preach. There's something that they say, it just connects with you. 
you are con you're even convicted and you even see changes happening in your life when they preach, when, you, when they speak. It's an inspiring space. It's like I love my church. Whenever Pastor Grace preaches, man, I love it. I feel excited. Hallelujah. And she's an amazing, passionate woman of God. I love my pastor. Hey, even me, I love Pastor Grace. She's an amazing woman. Amen. But do you know there are some people who get stuck on being inspired? Pastor Grace to Konawewe. You're my pastor. I love that church. But you stop with inspiration. And you never move beyond that. You come to church. You're inspired. You love your church. You even love the sermons. And by the way, I don't know if you've ever been there. Me, I've been there. Where I was inspired by a church for years without any difference in my life. I remember when I became a believer, I went to Nairobi Baptist Church for a while. I loved it. It was the highlight of my Sundays. Eish. It was such a good church. And by the way, anybody who went to Bapo in the day knows what I'm talking about. Amazing church. It's still an amazing church. It was an amazing church. And I loved going there as a youth. I mean, it was such a fun place. You connect with people. We danced. We... I loved it. It was very inspiring. But I was stuck on inspiration. I was not growing in my authority. I was not growing as a child of God. I was not growing in, my in, in being able to do great things for the kingdom. Number three, they change your behavior. This now moves from inspiration. And this leader, the person who is anointed, is able to change your behavior. You spend enough time listening to that person, and things actually begin to change in your life. As you notice, people even start to notice changes in your behavior. You find that you're waking up at a different time in your life. Come, come on, somebody. You used to be a night person. <laughs> you find that you're even praying differently. You couldn't pray for 10 minutes, now you're praying for an hour. Come on, somebody. Even people look at you like, at your where? At 4.30? You're praying. You. Pray. you. <laughs> Even your family members can't believe that you woke up to do what? Yeah. And people look at you and they say, since you said going to that church, something has changed in your life. They can see it. The evidence is there. There's a behavior change. Your life is changing. And that's a great level of anointing. Anybody who can say, since I started coming to Mavuno Church, there's been a change, noticeable change in my life. Yeah. Some of you, your family members are looking at you and they can't believe you. They're like, what? In fact, some of you, your family members' lives have been transformed because of watching you. They're like, if this one can change like this, surely there must be a God, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's called change. Like your life is being transformed. It's a beautiful thing to happen. But you know, there, 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 there are other levels beyond that. Apart from just your life being changed, your behavior being changed, you can get to the level where you speak what they speak. You find yourself in a place where now, it's not just your behavior. Even the way you're speaking now has changed. You have a certain authority to teach the same way those, that person teaches. You find that you're so inspired by your message, you can even teach those messages to other people. People even start listening to you in the office and they say, hey, this, this guy always has the right answer. You come and break down for people what your pastor taught and they're like, in fact, they think it's you. They're like, this one is just too smart. How is it that you know all these things? Something is changing in the way you teach. You have an authority. And people can even remark and say, this one looks different. This one sounds different. There are some people who I've heard where people have said, my goodness, that person teaches like Pastor M. In fact, when you close your eyes, you, when you close your eyes, you can even hear the same authority Pastor M has. Have you ever heard of somebody saying that? Yes. Maybe they say, he teaches, that one, when they, when they speak, you hear Pastor Kilonzi speaking. Yes. Yeah. I, I hear that authority. There's something about them that is just like their pastor. You start to speak like the pastor. You start to speak like your teacher. I've actually had that happen to me. I've had people come and say, Pastor Ayman, I when you speak, I hear there's an authority you speak with that I've had Pastor Oscar speak with. I've had people tell me that, especially in the early days, by the way. A lot of people used to tell me, I, when, especially when I was very young, where people could be like, where does this one get his authority from? Because he's not teaching like a young person. I remember once going to a Mavuno church, with my good wife, and we were listening to a sermon by a much younger preacher. And I think the preacher must have been in his late 20s. But this sermon had been written by Pastor Simon Bevy. How many of you know Pastor S? Yeah. 
And Pastor S had written a sermon about women and issues of women. And this young guy, I don't even know if he was married at the time, he just took Pastor Simon's message and preached it word for word. And you know, at first I was a bit nervous because I'm like, now this young guy, he's teaching my wife how to be a woman. And there were several women around my wife's age who were sitting near us, her friends. And I was thinking, hey, this one's going to be hard for this. I'm sure he's sweating. Because I've been a preacher, I know how you sweat. I was like, this one is sweating bullets right now. But you know, at one point in the message, I looked up and I saw my wife crying. And then I looked at her friends and all of them were in tears. And I realized, my God, it's not the young man. It's the anointing of the person whose message he's teaching. Because that man by himself would not have made women 12, 15 years older than him to be impacted that way by the Holy Spirit. There's something that happens. There's just a transfer when you start teaching. Like the person who teaches you teaches. There's an authority that has come into your life. That's a level of anointing transfer. I'm trying to say this because some of you, I'm trying to show you that maybe you've not reached a level of anointing transfer that you should be aspiring to. You need to be aspiring to the place where you're saying, when I see Pastor God did teach, I want to teach with the same authority. Yeah. I don't just want to teach. I want to teach in the same. I want people to respond. Yeah. When I see Pastor Godi meeting someone on a plane, and then they have a conversation, and then by the time he lands, he's already telling me that person, uh, they've agreed we're taking them through Mizizi and they're planting a church in their country. Who does that? Yeah. If you're under him, you need to be saying, even me, I want that authority. I want to speak with authority because, I mean, how do you do that? You speak to a stranger, first of all, you lead them to Christ, then you plan to do a Mizizi online, and then you tell them you'll be my church planter, and they say, yes. Uh-uh, you try. <laughs> you try. See whether it will happen. But you need to be aspiring to it. To be able to say, I don't just want to come to your church and, and, and have my life changed. I want to have the authority that you have. I want to see people's lives changed as well. I want to have people listen to me because God has called me to be a disciple of nations. This is not about my own greatness. It's about my effectiveness. It's about the, 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 the assignment God has called me to. I can't make disciples if I don't have anointing. I want to sound like the person, the person who I'm following. But there's a level beyond that. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, there's another level. Number six, you become like them. Number five. Number five. You become like them. You become like them. You know, you spend enough time with that preacher that you start having the same life that they have. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they saw courage. But then they saw that these men were unschooled and they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. That there's a way these people were living now that people saw how they were living and they were reminded of Jesus. Jesus was dead. Wasn't in the scene anymore. But the way these men lived, it's like Jesus was still alive. They could see his impact in the lives of these men. There was a resemblance between these men and the rabbi they were following. When you become like your leader, you find yourself sounding, not just sounding like them, but even doing the things that they do. <laughs> your finances start resembling their finances. Hey, by the way, me, I want all your finances to resemble my finances. Yeah, I do. I do. You start, people start looking at you and saying, how is it that you have acceleration with ease like this? How is it that you're not worried about money? And they're like, this one looks like they go to Mavuno Church. Those people don't seem stressed about money issues. There's something about their lives. You find that your marriage starts to resemble their marriage. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah. People look at your marriage and they're like, this one, their marriage looks like. Your children starts to resemble their children. Yeah, people look at your kids and there's something about these kids. There's something about them. Yeah. And they remind you. By the way, when I see Pastor James' kids, I remember my kids at that age. They act exactly the same way. Isn't it, Pastor Carol? Yeah. The way they hug their father is the way my kids used to hug me. I don't even think Pastor James is aware. But you see, for me now, I see it. The same way he talks about them is the way I used to talk about my kids when they were that age. Yeah. But he's hung around me a long time. We've been together for a long, long time. Yeah. Cindy or Pastor James? Yeah. 
By the way, I see him doing things and I'm like, wow, I did exactly the same thing. But it's not the doing, it's the results. His kids are so respectful. I know they're around. Yeah, Pastor James, you have amazing kids. Yeah, you have amazing kids. Bless God for you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is when I see my kids, I remember Bishop Oscar's kids. In fact, it's uncanny, the resemblance. Sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, too much. Even some of the bad things, we're like, what? Some of the things you struggled with, you're struggling with. Yeah, that's a danger. <laughs> but you know, it's amazing because our ki his kids are amazing kids. Yeah. But I watched, we watched, and there was a transmission. Something passed on. Yeah, Pastor Nyama, you'll have amazing kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, amen. People walk into their home and they say, there's a way this home is run that reminds you of another home I've seen. There's something different. Your life begins to change. You lead meetings the way they lead meetings. Yeah. One of the things about my mentor, Bishop Oscar, when I used to be in his church, he, he comes into a room. Bishop Oscar never just comes and flows. He comes and disrupts. If he comes and you've planned for him an event or something, he comes and then he's like, okay, that, just push it to put it here. This one, put it here. This. You're like, we've been planning. He's like, yeah, but who are you planning for? See, it was for me. Now me, I want it this way. And I used to look at him like, you're so bold. Hey. <laughs> Some of my pastors know I have disrupted them. Yeah. And people say, wow, the way he leads me, there's a pattern in his life. And I never used to be like that, by the way. I just picked up. Something just flows in your life. You become like them. But then there's another level. Tell your neighbor, there's another level. Ha <laughs> ha. And this is a sweet one. You're going to like this level. You receive their ministry. You receive their ministry. This is when you find yourself running a ministry that is similar to or greater than the ministry your mentor was running. You receive their ministry. You know, it's interesting because you find yourself that there are strong similarities between your ministries because anointing has been transferred. But generally, if it was transferred well, your ministry should even be greater. You should be able to do things your father was not doing, your mother was not doing, your spiritual leader was not doing. Because you are standing on their shoulders. Jesus says you will do greater things. John 14, 12. He says, very truly I tell you, you will do greater things than I've been doing. He says, why? Because I'm going to the Father. Because now I'm standing with the Father, I can intercede for you. I will give you an opportunity to do greater things than me because I'm in your corner. Now you're not just running by yourself. You have somebody whose shoulders you're standing on. And so you should be able to see farther than that person so because you're standing on their shoulders. And Jesus says, you will do greater things than this because I'm going to the Father. And this is a beautiful thing about, this is a, another whole level, a whole another level of being transformed where you find you have an even greater ministry, even greater impact than the person whom you were following. You know, it's very interesting. Many, many, many of you don't even understand this because I remember when, when Pastor Oscar would teach us as his team and say, you will do greater things than me. He used to tell us those words. And I remember I was the worst skeptic. I'm like, I surely, I've seen you preaching. I've seen you abroad and being received by people. I've seen the authority you have globally. That's a lie. You're just saying things to make us happy. Yeah, that's what I thought. You're doing that because pastors are paid to do that, to make people feel happy about themselves. That's honestly, I was a skeptic. Yeah. But you know what? I won't even say. It happens. I found myself doing things that none of my fathers did. And it's not because of me. I believe anointing was transferred and I was standing on shoulders. Yeah. When I started Mavuno, I couldn't, Mavuno accelerated in a way that was not explainable. It was not, it was not explainable because I was not that. There are some pastors who are just gifted as pastors. They stand, by the way, you have pastors who just, they preach in one-liners. Everything they say is a quotable quote. In fact, by the time you're writing, they've already moved to the next one. You're like, stop, can I pause you so I can write the one you've just... Do you know pastors like those? They're just phenomenal teachers. They're incredible. And people say that's why their church grew. Hey, me, I'm glad I don't have those gifts. Because nobody can take the glory except Jesus. And you know what? The only reason this thing exploded and God did what he's doing is because I was standing on the shoulders of others. And the Holy Spirit allowed that anointing of those who had gone before me to be transferred to me. 
and I could do things that those before me were doing. You know, it's very interesting because some people leave a ministry before their time. They leave at a different level of impartation. You see, maybe you've, you've been at a place where you've changed your behavior. And at that point, you are so excited, you left Mavuno because of whatever reason. You got offended or maybe you just felt you've outgrown the church and you moved. And you know, the funny thing is, you will continue, that change will continue to be in your life. I still, met, I still meet Mavunites who are still being fearless influencers because they were part of this ministry. Yeah. But you know what? Their ministry is not greater than my ministry. And I actually look at them and I don't think they have a chance of that. At least not the way they are operating right now. And it's because they, where they left is where they are operating. They still have the level of anointing of 2012 Mavuno. Am I talking to somebody? So you could live at a certain place where you're teaching how your pastor teaches, but you still don't have a ministry as big as or greater than their ministry. I can tell you, by the way, Pastor Godwin, you will have a greater ministry than mine. Yeah. In Jesus' name, you and Pastor Noel will do far greater things than Pastor Caro and I are doing. You know why? Because I am determined that you will be greater than me. It is my failure if you don't do greater things than us. So we will put our energy behind you. We will put our prayer behind you because we want you to do greater things than us. And you will in Jesus' name. Yeah, you will. <laughs> you have no choice. You will. And I'm saying that to all my sons and daughters. You will do greater things than me. Yeah, that's the way God intended his family to work. So I want you to understand, sometimes people live at inspiration. And I still meet people who are like, hey, Maze, I love Mavuno Bana. We used to do such good things. Amazing church. Every Sunday was different. I love Mavuno. I'm like, praise God. Praise God for you. I'm glad you're inspired. <laughs> I hope you continue being inspired the rest of your life. You know, it's not a bad thing to be inspired. But tell your neighbor there's more. There's more. Yeah. Don't leave before your time. Leave when the Lord sends you. Because you don't want to get stuck. You don't want to get stuck. Some mistakes to avoid. Let me say some mistakes to avoid. Every time you teach this, you have to give these caveats. If you teach this, what I'm teaching about anointing, make sure people understand these mistakes because these mistakes are very easy for people to pass on and that's where error begins. Mistake number one, avoid the mistake of not reading the word for yourself. Make sure your disciples are reading the word for themselves so that they always know God's voice. Guys, I want you to know my, God's voice better than my own voice. Yeah. That's why listening to my talks should never replace your Bible reading. I'd rather you don't listen to me and read the Bible if you have to make a choice. Make sure you read. I always tell people, read the Bible for yourself. Listen to God for yourself, even as you're listening to your prophet. Listen to God. Avoid the, the mistake of not reading the word for yourself. You need to be a Berean. Even Paul, the people who are receiving his anointing, they would receive his word and then go and read it for themselves to see whether what he was saying was consistent with the word. So one of the things you want to do when you listen on Sunday is to go and re-listen with the scriptures. So you can even pause and say, Alisema, Corinthians what? Angoja, wait a minute, does that actually say that? Read it for yourself. That allows you to understand this is consistent with God's word. Because it's never a person, it's all, anointing comes from God, not a person. So read God's word for yourself. Number two, avoid thinking it is a person who will anoint you. It's not a person who will anoint you, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's God who anoints you. Through a man or woman, but it is God who does it. So even as I teach this, I'm not saying I have any special power. It's just that God has put you in this family, and because he has, he has poured something in me for you. But it is God who brought, who brought you here, not me. And it is God's purpose and mission that you will fulfill, not mine. Number three, Avoid, listen, avoid the mistake of listening to their messages only when you have a, a preaching engagement. <laughs> Discipleship group leaders, when, when you're going to meet your group and you know you have questions, that's not the time to listen to the, to the gathering. Yeah, sometimes we listen because, you know, it's I need the answer to this question. So let me listen to this. Be a listener. Soak yourself. Immerse yourself. We talked about the power of listening and why that's important. You will actually see a difference. You'll actually see a difference in your life when you become an active listener to the message that God is giving your house uh, through the leader that God has put in your life. So listen to messages all the time. 
And then avoid the mistake of not acknowledging your source. You're going to be very smart when you start quoting Pastor James. Yeah, people will be like, Eish, maze, when, we talk, when you counsel us about marriage, man, this is a like way you, you just talk. Hey, be humble and just say, hey, even me, even us, we're helped by Pastor Jemo. <laughs> if not for him, we would not be talking to you like this. Yeah. I've learned to acknowledge. Yeah. But the things I've taught you, I've been taught all of them. There's nothing I... Sometimes I'll add something as I grow and as I experience it in my life, but generally I pass on what has been passed on to me. So share the source. Let, let, acknowledge your source because then that's a way to keep humble and to keep understanding you need to learn more. And then number, number four, number five. Before, by the way, I haven't even started on my topic. My topic is how following an anointed person will make you unshakable. This is the introduction. <laughs> this, this is just giving you some things on top. Is that okay? Avoid the mistake of confusing following with cloning. If you've listened to everything I've said, some of you are like, I, I, am I becoming a clone of my leader? Am I becoming, when, I, when you say becoming like a person, talking like a person, are we supposed to all become clones? I think that's ignorance when you ask that question. Why, why, why is that? Let me tell you this. If you've ever studied, okay, I know you haven't. For those who study medicine, see, it's true, you haven't. How many, how many people here who are medics, studied medicine? Let me just see a show of hands. I knew there'd be one around there. Ah, the Holy Spirit showed me. There's another one there. Is there another one? There's one at the back there. There's another one there. There's another one there. There's another one there. Wow, to God be like, let's appreciate all our medics. They're here. Yeah. So you guys who do medicine, you probably know this better than anyone, that the first thing you do when you're doing medicine after you do the theory is you get practicums, isn't it? And you go and you follow a qualified doctor. You do rounds with that doctor. Your work is to observe. Have you ever seen medics walking around with a, doc with a professor in the hospital? They have their two little notebooks. And the professor comes, he does what he's doing in the patient, and their job is to take notes. And what are they doing? They are learning how to treat a patient. What do you check when you arrive? What are the comments? And then afterwards, he'll see, uh -huh, what did you guys hear? And they will debrief. And what he's trying to teach them is how to do things exactly the way he does them. It's even worse if you're in surgery. Because you're not allowed anywhere near a live patient. They'll allow you the dead ones. <laughs> but a live one you don't touch until you've watched your professor doing that surgery and helped. And many times you'll watch for a while, huh? And you watch so that you can do exactly what they do. There are some professions that are not open for creatives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't want a creative surgeon. A guy who decides, ah, Maze, I'm so bored of, of cutting like this. What would happen if I did like a rapper, like, like I just feel today like being different? Ah, you don't want that guy. You want to, t you want, by the time you're being allowed to have your own scissors and to be able to cut with your own forceps, you have to have already held them for someone else for some time. And then they are going to finally allow you to do one when people are watching you. And of course you might make a mistake, but then you're corrected. But the whole idea is by the time you're now doing your own operation, you can do it exactly the way the chief surgeon taught you how to do it. And then they trust you now to start doing it for yourself. And you learn from that point on. Now maybe eventually, as you study some more, you will learn something your professor never taught you. You will discover something. And at that point, you'll be able to come and say, my goodness, in fact, you'll have to write a peer-reviewed paper before you start just doing human trials on yourself. And then at that point, people will accept it, and now at that point, you'll become a teacher of others as well. Have you become a clone? No, you've just become a qualified surgeon. Isn't it? Yeah. And in case I'm using examples you can't qualify, you can't understand. Even hairdressing is taught the same way, by the way. Even cooking is taught the same way. Yeah. You watch your mother turning that to gully. But she won't give you a to cook for the family, you'll poison people. <laughs> you first put the water, she, wa she watches you, she, you do it, you watch her do it several times. Then she'll tell you, try, you make like a small one, 
That one, she says, you eat that one first. <laughs> Before you take that one to my husband, you know. But slowly you get to the place where you can do it exactly the way your mother did it. And then now you're qualified to serve the family. And at that point, a few years later, as you gain wisdom, you'll, you'll even make it better than your mother made it. But before that, you first do it the way she did it. Has she provided, uh, produced a clone? No, she has produced another competent chef in the family. Are you understanding? So anybody who's like, but why am I doing it the way Pastor, Pastor James, is, Pastor Milton is doing it? It's because he's a qualified cook teaching you how to be a qualified cook. <laughs> am I talking to somebody in the house? Yeah. So some of us are so creative. We are so creative. It's like, why do I have to do it like Pastor Milton? Me, I want to do it like this. You're going to kill people. This is not, these are souls, people. <laughs> we don't experiment with people's lives. You follow and you learn. Yeah. Jesus is a great physician. Exactly. So his people follow him for three years. And by the way, do you notice at some point he says, go in twos. And then he says, go and actually cast out demons. And they go. And then they come back to report, we saw demons falling from heaven like lightning. Then he's like, okay, I like that you saw, but let me teach you some theology behind what you saw. The most important thing, if you get caught up with that, you will get lost. The most important thing to always remember is that your name is in the book of life. I think the professor now is going through and teaching them. So when they send out their disciples, they'll also tell them the same. By the way, the demon fell, that's okay. The most important thing, your name is in the book of life. Casting out demons is not hard, by the way. It's not hard. <laughs> yeah. By the way, that doesn't... Casting out demons. I cast out a demon when I was a new Christian. It's not hard to cast out a demon. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> it's... Because it's a demon. <laughs> <laughs> but greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. By the way, without knowing much theology, without knowing much spiritual warfare, I cast out a demon. So that should not, Jesus is like, that should not be the thing that thrills you. The real thing to understand, the day you understand that your name is written in the book of life and nothing can shake you from God's love, something will change in your life. That is much harder to do than casting out a demon. Yeah. What is he doing? He's training them. So allow yourself to be trained. Allow yourself to become like the person God has put in your life to train you. You see, the problem is we have seen ministry as a career. That's the biggest problem in the church today. I come to church thinking, me, I'm a pilot. My pastor is a pastor. So his job is to be a pastor. Me, mine is to be a pilot. That's a lie. Tell anybody that's a lie. Your pastor is a minister of the house of God, a minister of the kingdom of God whose job it is to equip you in your main profession, which is a minister in the house of God in Kenya Airways. Are you understanding? Tell, if you understand, say, I'm understanding. Yeah. So when you come to church, don't come saying, that's the work of pastors. Understand, the work of the pastor is to equip God's people to do the work of ministry. My ministry is to equip your ministry. All of us are supposed to be in ministry. It's just that God has put you in a certain place to, allow, to practice what I'm teaching you. So whenever you come, you want to be able to get to the place where you walk into your workplace with the same authority as Pastor M and you lead people to Christ. Am I talking good? Am I teaching good for somebody? Yeah. There should be no difference between me and you. I see some students. What school are you guys from? Isili. Come on, let's appreciate the team from Isili. Yeah. Amen. Bless God for you. As a student... You should be able to have the same authority as your pastor. I'm a student, but I'm a servant of the Most High God. Yeah. There's actually somebody here who is from Maseno University. Jesse. And Jesse, one of the things he told me when I met him yesterday, where is Jesse? He's somewhere around. Jesse told me he's a student, a first year student in Maseno. But he told me, but I have 20 disciples among my first year peers. As in, he went to that school looking like a student but he's actually a servant of the Most High God. The student is just his cover. He's coming here to disrupt the work of the devil in that place. That's your work. Wherever you're going, you're going to disrupt the work of the devil. You should have the same anointing and authority as Pastor Kilonzi, if that's your father. Yeah. You should be going to your office and say, come on, demons just flee. <laughs> it's true. 
So understand that you want to move beyond just being inspired, to being transformed, to looking like, to sounding like, to being like, to having the ministry. And your ministry should actually exceed my ministry in your workplace, in the church that God has put you in charge of. Come on, say somebody, somebody say amen. amen. Have I helped you right now? Yes. Amen, amen. So let me now go to my sermon. <laughs> let me go to my talk. How following an anointed person will make you unshakable. Uh, this one I won't take too long with because we've talked about being unshakable and anointing is one of the principal ways God wants to prepare you this year to be unshakable in your faith. One of the things anointing will do for you, it will give you resilient faith. Resilient faith. Isn't that one of the things God promised us? Psalm 144 verse 1. Praise be to the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. You know, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and James, or Peter and John were arrested and they were thrown into jail overnight, put on trial by the Sanhedrin. And it was interesting, we talked about this, they were required to defend themselves. And this man stood, these men stood up, uneducated men, and they spoke with such authority that these people noticed that these unschooled men had been with Jesus. There's something about them, they should have been scared. Uneducated fishermen being invited. Imagine it's almost like saying some border border guys or some hawker somewhere was caught and taken before the city council commissioners. You're put there in front of all the, the, the key, the governor and all his people to defend yourself. Of course, you should be intimidated, isn't it? You've never entered such places. They're expecting you to be terrified of them. But what do these men start they do? They stand and speak with authority, they're not shakable. They say, listen, you are the ones who killed Jesus. In fact, that's the first thing Peter says. You killed Jesus, but God raised him. Ha <laughs> ha. And these guys are shocked. Aren't you scared of us? But there's nothing scared about these people because they know who is in them. And you know, they were beaten <laughs> and they were told not to teach about Jesus anymore. And what do they do? They go to the church and they pray a great prayer. And they say in Acts chapter 4, uh, actually it's Acts chapter 4 verse 29 the end of the chapter they say now Lord consider their threats because they had been threatened they had been told you will actually be killed if we see you preaching about Jesus what do they preach they don't say oh God help us we are being persecuted what's wrong with these people they want to kill us isn't that how some of us would be praying like Lord we're only trying to be faithful why are you allowing this to happen that's not how they pray listen to how they pray they say now Lord Let's pray this because I want us to learn to pray like this. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Verse 30. What else do they say? Are you there? Verse 30. Come on, come on, come on. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're like, we've been threatened. Aha, Lord, consider those threats. Now, fill us with anointing. Fill us with power. Because we want to do signs and wonders and miracles. The things they told us not to do, we even want more power to do those things. God is honored by such prayers. You know those fear, fear prayers of, God, what are you doing? God's looking at you like, seriously, you don't get it? But when you pray like this, God responds. And you know how God responds? Verse 31. Let's go to verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Ha! Come on. Fearless influencers. You try to put them down, they pray for more power and more authority. You try to intimidate them so that they can take bribes, they pray for more courage and say no more. Yeah, you can't shake them. These guys were unshakable. God wants us to have resilient faith this year. That's why he says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. You need the anointing to stand firm. You need the anointing to stand firm. You see, these are the same men who had fled when Jesus was persecuted in the garden, was arrested. But now there was something different about them. After the anointing came, something changed. In Acts chapter 12, a little later, Herod decides to become popular. And he kills James. 
he kills one of the, the lead disciples, one of the key disciples. He, he, he kills him with a sword, the Bible tells us. And then he arrests Peter. He's like, I'm going to arrest the two leaders. So he arrests Peter and throws him in jail. And it's like, you can imagine most churches now, how they'd be praying. Pastor M has been short. I'm just trying to put it in context. That's a, isn't that what's happening? The pastor of the movement has been short. And then the other one has been arrested. They exact him now in jail. How are you guys praying at this point? God have mercy. In fact, some people will not show up for, for 30 prayers in case there are spies there to catch them, you know. It's like, what? Fear catches the church. But you know what happens? The disciples called another prayer meeting. So this was their response when they were intimidated. They called prayer meetings. Wow. Ah, may this be your response in life. Amen. When the boss threatens to fire you, you call your discipleship group for prayer meeting in your house. Yeah, we pray for boldness. We pray for God's will to be done. And you know what happened in the middle of their prayer? An angel appeared in jail, opened the, the prison, put the guard asleep, opened the prison door, and Peter was released to freedom. I mean, he just walked out, and all the guards were asleep because of the prayer of these unshakable saints. When you receive the Holy Spirit's power, you receive boldness. That's what happens. By the way, one of the marks of anointing is boldness. When you see a bold person, when you see an anointed person, you see a bold person. There are things they're not afraid to say. There are things they're not afraid to do because it's not them. It's the Holy Spirit in them. When these people became bold, they lose their fear. You know, I remember for me that I used to be so scared. I really was scared of people and what they thought. When I was told that, when, when, when Pastor Oscar asked me to preach my first sermon, I hated it. By the way, I hated, 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 hated the thought of preaching. It was not even like the top 150 things I could have written as a fun thing to do. I hated it. Like I couldn't see myself as a preacher. Yeah? Wendy, can you see yourself as a preacher? I couldn't. I hated it. And then to make things worse, I had a really, I mean, this guy was crazy. He put me in charge of preaching a whole sermon series in the main church. Not even in the youth church or the children's church, Angalao. I was starting off. <laughs> Pastor Wendy, you should do a series in Mavuno Church. Yeah. That's what I, I was put in charge. And I was told, he never told me what to preach. He told me, here, preach on the book of James. Huh? Book of who? <laughs> You have to understand, I was a new intern in this church. And then I'm supposed to be preaching through the book of James. It was the deep end. I remember being so terrified. I'd wake up in the middle of the night in the, like, I had loose stool. Okay, I'm giving a bit of too much detail. I couldn't keep it together. I was scared. I was chewing my nails. Like, my nails were bleeding that whole month. I hated it. Every Saturday I'd call to say, I can't, I can't until he stopped picking my calls. The first one I called him in the night, 11 o'clock. Pasi, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> You're going to have to do this. He told me, I believe in you. Just pray. Trust the Holy Spirit. See you in the morning. Ding. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, it was painful. I preached. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. Is someone feeling me? Hey, I hated it. I hated it. <laughs> but look at me now. I actually, I've actually come to believe teaching is one of the things that God is going to use to help me achieve my assignment. Wow. I love teaching you guys. Wow. I love teaching this family. I do. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I, like, I, like I pray for, like I'm like, God, I can't wait for the gathering so I can teach again. I feel like, I, like God has just given me the, the love for you that I want to do whatever it takes for you to understand what God's love for you is. Like, I love to teach. I love to teach. That's what the anointing does. It takes people who are scared and makes them bold. Yeah. There's someone who told me the last time I shared that, they said, I can't imagine you, Pastor M, being scared. That's not me. That's the anointing. The natural me, uh-uh. Something would be different. You know, it's interesting. I told you we were at a funeral the other day. Not the other day. <laughs> this last week. And it was my, my family members, uh, extended family. But I noticed something very interesting. I noticed that my dad's anointing 
passed on all his children. We're just talking about that with Pastor Carol. Because we are many, many cousins. We're a big extended family. But at some point I realized, in fact, one of the, <laughs> one of the meetings, my sister's daughter led worship. My brother led the meeting. I preached. You know, at some point I was like, hey, there's something different about our family. Eh? Like, they just told me, by the way, you're the one preaching this week. I was like, sour. They told my bro, you're the one leading. In fact, the funeral had like a thousand, like a thousand plus people. They told my bro, you're the one leading. He's like, all right, bring it on. It's like, we're not scared of people. There's an anointing that passes on to you. Something changes you and you just become bold. And you stop fearing. Does your neighbor look bold, by the way? There's a resilience. There's a resilience. Yeah, there's a resilience. <laughs> It's a resilience. Yeah. As I mentioned, I used to be a people pleaser. There are some things I could never do. I was afraid of doing them because of what will people think of me. But I can tell you now, I really feel nothing for what people think of me. Like I feel nothing, honestly. I understand now the prophets. You know the prophets did some crazy things? Isaiah walked butt naked for three years because God told him to walk naked to show how they are going to be because of their disobedience of God. Isaiah was actually from the royal family. So you'd imagine a guy like that has some class. God told him, just remove. Shake it. No shame. God has said, I'm going to do it. Ezekiel. Ezekiel was told to cook his food on human dung. So you poop, collect your food, Come and put it there. Everybody sees and they're like, what are you doing? And then cook your food on it. And you're told, you do that to show them the kind of life they're going to have because of their disobedience to God. He's like, all right, bring it on. Let's do it. I don't care what people think about me anymore. God's will is first. That's anointing, by the way. Hosea was told to marry a prostitute. <laughs> All right, I should move on. Anointing will make you resilient. Anointing will make you unstoppable. The enemy will not be able to stop you. Number two, the other way anointing will help you become unshakable is in the area of God's business. Remember, that was the second thing God told us about this year. Proverbs 16.3. Commit your ways to the Lord and he will establish your plans. That's what the verse says. When you, who you hang out with determines who you become. Your foundation determines your elevation. When it comes to achieving God's purpose for your life, many people go as far as their gift allows them to go. And some people are very gifted. Some people are very gifted. And because of that, they can go farther than most people. But your gift is not enough. There's a man here called Pastor Baji. Pastor Baji, you're one of the most gifted young people I know. Yeah. This guy is so gifted. He's not just gifted as a dancer. He's a great performer in every way you can think of. He's a great leader. He attracts people. By the way, if this guy calls for a street party, there'll be at least 200 people who show up. Ask your neighbor, you try. Yeah. You try. <laughs> He's so gifted. And by the way, Pastor Baji, your gift can take you far. It can take you far. But can I tell you a secret? Following Pastor Milton will take you 10 times as far. Yeah. It will take you 10 times as far. Just follow your father. Because he, his anointing will open the door for your gift to propel you to where it should go. Yeah, gifting is good. And I'm grateful you're gifted. It's a beautiful thing. But it's anointing that will get you there. Yeah. Come on, let's appreciate Pastor Baji. He's an amazing man an amazing man yeah yeah like I said Samson was one of the most gifted people in the Old Testament isn't it but he didn't go far he couldn't follow anybody even his own parents he had no respect for them he was not a follower and so his gift his incredible gift did not help him achieve his purpose you know, when we were a young couple, we were so grateful. I'm so grateful now when I think about the church we are part of. And this is the beauty of a church that is a family. Because we were surrounded by many other couples. And many of them were older than us. 
And it was so good to have people who just spoke into our lives. People who modeled marriage for us, godly marriage for us. It was such a beautiful thing because many of them, I mean the kind of lies as we saw them, we saw the mistakes they made and they allowed us to see. We saw that the successes they made, we saw how they followed God. And that's one thing we really learned, how to follow God in your marriage. Again, I said we were blessed to have pastors who had a very simple life lifestyle. Our pastor did not care much about being rich. He didn't care. In fact, he was a man of such high integrity. You could never corrupt that guy with money. He, he's a guy who taught me to fear, <laughs> to have a strong, healthy fear of God's money. His life was full of integrity. And as we watched that, we we're like, wow, guess what? Our own lives aligned. And I just find myself, I don't feel, I don't have a struggle, by the way, separating Mavuno things and my things. I don't, I never, by the way, I don't get, I don't have a struggle with that. Some pastors might struggle with that. Like, I feel like I need to take some church money. I don't have a struggle with that at all. At all, at all, at all, at all. Because for me, I know God's business. And I know God is able to take care of his business. But there's something about anointing that helps you align to God's business. It helps you align to achieving your mission. You know, there are many Christians, when we were in our college group, we were, made, we were a big group of Christians, and they were on fire for Jesus. But I can tell you, many of them never achieved the potential that we all had to become disciple makers of nations. Many of them didn't. And you know what the secret was? It's the transfer of anointing. Having, hanging around people who are blessed a certain way that helped us become blessed in the same way. I don't struggle, by the way, to follow God. I don't struggle to make my business his business. I don't struggle to surrender what I have to God. And I'm not saying this in any way boastfully. By the way, I know it, came to, it was given to me. I'm grateful I followed men and women who that was their legacy. And as a result, I learned to make God's business my business. If you want to achieve your God-given purpose, if you want your life not to just have potential like Samson, but to actually achieve something powerful, you need to understand. You see, like Elijah, El 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 Elisha, he didn't achieve it because of his gift. He achieved it because of the anointing. And he achieved the purpose God had for him. Follow somebody. It will cause you to achieve God's business. You know, one of the things that I believe is that God intends all of us in this church to have prosperity. And what is prosperity? Not all of us are going to become millionaires. That's not what prosperity is. Not all of us are going to drive Jaguars. Not all of us are going to, it's not necessary. You know what? Prosperity is to have the resources you need to achieve God's kingdom purpose. That's what prosperity is. If I have enough resources to achieve the purpose I was created for, which includes helping the people around me, then I'm prosperous. When I lack the resources to achieve God's purpose, then I'm not prosperous, isn't it? I believe that God wants us to be prosperous as a family. Yeah, somebody, somebody hears and understands what I'm talking about. Yeah, there's some people who don't believe they can be prosperous. That's why they're not clapping. <laughs> yeah, you can and you will and that's your legacy. So here's the thing. I want to just say, I mean, one of the things I'm excited about, I know that I talked about getting out of debt. Guys, get out of debt. Take that as an instruction from the Most High. Get out of debt. It's not your business. Debt is not God's business. You'll be a slave to someone else. The Holy Spirit will go, say, go this way, and the bank will tell you, no, go that way. And you have to listen to the bank or everything goes, isn't it? So that's how you're a slave. So get out of debt if you're not in, out of debt already. If you need help, talk to your campus pastor. Say, I need coaching. And if your campus pastor gets stuck, they know how to, pro, to take that up to your network pastor. And that can even come up to you. I don't mind. We will help you. But let's get all of us out of debt. Let's get all of us in a place of prosperity where we are saving. Last year, we gave the, the mandate of saying every one of us should start being a saver. We want to create the resources and ability for us to do that. By the way, next month, let me give you a sneak preview. One of the things we're going to be doing next month in our series, I want to challenge every discipleship group to, make, to become your brother's keeper. There cannot be somebody who is jobless in our DG and we call ourselves a our DG. We must come together and say, how are we using all our resources, our networks, whatever, to get this person to have a job? Yeah, the same way you'd be thinking about your child. If your child was jobless, you'd be saying, by the way, Jackie, where do you work? Are there jobs? See, that's how parents are shameless, isn't it? Me, I've had parents come and tell me, by the way, that business of yours, do you have jobs? Because parents are shameless. They want to get a job for their children. 
Ah, uh-uh. we want to do the same with our DG and say so there should be no unemployed among us in Jesus' name. Yeah. We have all the resources. We have the resources to ensure it. No, nobody in Mavuno should be waiting for handouts. We can hand each other up, isn't it? We can raise each other up. That's one of the things. I'm already preaching next month's series. Yeah. If you have a business and you're in a DG, you're selling potatoes, and then somebody's going to buy city market potatoes, Marikiti, Shindwe. Why? Yeah, why? As a DG, we should be responsible to help you produce the best potatoes. If it's the quality of your potatoes we have a problem with, let's come around you and help you. Let's go and buy for you samples. We tell you, this one tastes better than yours. Why? You know. Yeah. But all of us in that DG should be your first customers. Yeah. And then once we finish, we should be marketing for you like it's our own business. You go and tell your mom, mom, where do you buy potatoes? Ah, uh-uh, we have a guy. I have a guy and he's very good. And treat it like it's your own business. Isn't it? That's how the anointing of this house will be transmitted. The other thing we'll be doing next month, I'm just giving you the sneak preview. So that you know, it's like the movie. I'm telling you how the movie will end. <laughs> this is not even a trailer. It's, the, it's like the spoilers. <laughs> next month, we're going to be launching the Mavuno, uh, fear, the fearless, uh, I think it's a fearless financial fund or something like that. It's going to be our, our SACO, our investment cooperative. Yeah. He doesn't even have a name yet. <laughs> it will have a name by that time. And we'll be creating an opportunity for us to save as a church and to ensure that we have resources so that in a few years, not a single one of us will struggle to figure out how to build a house. Yeah. I'm excited about that. And like I told you, I feel like there's a reset coming financially and God's people need to move to a kingdom economy. The capitalist economy is failing. In fact, it's a, it's a godless economy. In fact, as, as Joe says, it has even collapsed already. I don't know if you know this, but the, the economy of the world right now, it's a lie. It's a lie. The economy of the world is hinged on the US dollar. The US dollar is hinged on air. It doesn't actually have any value. The only value for the US dollar, and I can say this on, in public, because it's been said, the only value that dollar has is the power of the US military. And their ability to tell you our dollar has value. And this is how much our dollar costs. They tell us. But there are, many, there, there are things happening right now so, uh, economically in the world that are shifting the dependence of the world on this dollar. And when that happens, you will find all our currencies are pegged on that dollar. Yeah. When I say there's a reset coming, you can imagine all the millions you have in the bank and one day you find their paper. Yeah. The, the world economy doesn't work. God's people have to think differently. Yeah, God's people think very, very differently. I believe it's going to be like the times of, of Joseph when the world economy collapsed and God sheltered his people in Goshen. Yeah. That's going to hap- it's going to happen. So I'm excited about this investment club we're launching. And it's going to be a catalytic vehicle for prosperity for the sons and daughters of this house. And what I want to say is anointing will help you achieve your kingdom business. Because my my desire is not to make you fabulously rich so that you can be like Elon Musk and show us your money. My desire is that you will achieve God's purpose and assignment for your generation. That's what God desires of all of us. Amen. All right, the last point. The third way anointing helps you become unshakable is, you know it, hidden treasures. Thank you, one boy. Somebody's paying attention here. Hidden treasures. Every family has inheritance. And for some, it includes wealth and physical belongings. Some of you have families that have wealth and physical belongings. I have a friend who was doing reasonably well. Reasonably well means he was struggling some months, some months he was okay. Then his dad passed on. And all of a sudden, my friend was not doing reasonably well. (laughs) He was at another level. All of a sudden, he was discussing certain levels of investment that even I didn't know about. All of a sudden, he was talking about Sijui Shambas here and Shambas there that he had not worked for. They were passed on to him. There was an, an inheritance that came physically to him. And some of you, that's that's going to happen to you. That's why I say never compare yourself with your friend. 
You can think we're languishing together. <laughs> you don't know what their inheritance is and which anointing they are tapped into because of their family. Some of you, there's no finance coming from your family. But do you know it's not just money you inherit from your family? Some of you have very good people skills. Yeah, because somehow your parents were just like that. You just got people skills. Some of you are entrepreneurs. There are people who just know how to make money. You know those people? They're always looking and they're asking, you, you just come, you're just eating the food in the restaurant. Then they're looking and thinking, where do these guys get their peas? How much are they paying? How much are peas in the market? You're like, so you just eat the food. Because you know, but taught you how to think like an entrepreneur, isn't it? Some people just got the hassle from their parents and they're gifted that way. Some people are great, they have, they have great marriages. Not because they worked, but because that's all they saw. Do you, understand? Do you realize that people who just saw good marriages growing up? Life is a bit unfair, isn't it? Because some people just saw good marriages, they didn't even struggle, while other people came up and it's like we've never even seen a woman and a man interact well. And now we are forced to work so hard at this thing, and other people are just breezing through it. That's inheritance. Inheritance is not just money. There are also things we receive from our families. Some of you have a great sense of style and fashion. <laughs> But then there are some people who just have a style of... Somehow they just, it was just passed on to them. They don't even think. Look at, look at Bob over here, Bob Colin. Yeah, he's, just, he's just like... It is, eh? I don't have to think. It's just the way I am. <laughs> some of you have... I, by the way, I know families with strong musical abilities. It's like the whole family was a choir. Is, Pastor, is, 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 Robbie, is Robbie voice here? Robbie Oywa. I mean, Robbie is a phenomenal musician, can play like 10 instruments, and the problem is all his siblings are like him. So I remember asking him, how are you guys like, why is it so unfair? Then he said, my dad was actually a, a phenomenal musician. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us were trying, <laughs> trying. <laughs> then they just, they just do, they just receive, yeah. But you know that it's a, in the same way, there's something called spiritual inheritance. Yeah. And it's a treasure that comes. Many it's not a treasure you work for. It's passed on to you. And all churches, by the way, have inheritance. There are some churches that are just crazy in intercession. By the way, if you think Mavuno is a praying church, you better stop thinking. There are churches that pray. There are churches that pray. What? There are some churches that just have an incredible gift. They pray like all the time. And it's just their gift. It's just, I mean, if you're part of that church, you just, that's your gift. We are all intercessors. It's a thing that happens when you're part of this church. Some other churches are gifted in evangelism. And by the way, you're part of that church, you just join a crusade team and you're always preaching somewhere. And it's just a thing. There are churches that are just gifted that way. There are churches that are prophetic. Everybody is a prophet in that church. And it's just a prophetic ministry. Everybody's in, in, in that. Other churches are gifted in business and marketplace. There's some churches that it's just, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure as I'm talking, you know some churches. That's just the way God has gifted them. And the beautiful thing is that through inheritance, anointing is passed on to the children of the house. It's a beautiful thing. Just the same way you're not supposed to envy the other family. You've got yours. The good thing is in the, in the spiritual realm, God doesn't leave anybody an orphan. He gives you the opportunity to be part of a family. And every family has inheritance. Tell your neighbor, we have inheritance in this house. You know, I tell people that this house is a house of good marriages. It's not a magical thing, by the way. And it's not saying that you don't work on your marriage because your parents have a good marriage. You know, there are people who have parents with good marriages and then they don't have. They're there. So you also have to work on it. But what it's telling you is, you're in a house where this is an inheritance. And should you choose to work on it, your marriage will work out well. You know, Pastor Kara and I, we didn't have to think about good marriages. We're those, parents, we're those kids who are fortunate because both our parents had phenomenal marriages. So for me, the word divorce has never crossed my imagination. It's not even a thought. And it's not because we're lucky. I was lucky to be married to the right person. By the way, everyone's married to the right person. 
The problem is you. <laughs> yeah. The problem is me. I know that. I know that. So for me, I always knew, whatever it is, we will work it out. Because I saw it modeled. And what I'm saying is, that is your spiritual inheritance. God convicted us that this was not a gift for the two of us. It was a gift for every couple in this house. You will have a good marriage. It's your inheritance. Now, like I said, there are some people who will be inspired by that message. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, don't get inspired. Get anointed. Yeah. Don't get inspired. Get anointed. Yeah. Receive the anointing. Don't just receive the inspiration. That's not just a sweet picture. That's your picture. Yeah, receive it. It's yours. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> This is a house of wealth without sorrow. It's a blessing of this house. It's an anointing of this house. When you see me teaching you about getting out of debt, I'm not giving you some ideas. I'm telling you how this anointing is going to pass on to you. Yeah. And when I tell you, don't, debt is not the way we're going to operate. We're going to operate on the kingdom economy. That's the way we operate, and we believe it's a gift to this church. And even as we start this investment uh, cooperative, that's the whole idea is that this is going to be a vehicle for wealth creation. Because we can't be rich parents with poor children. In Jesus' name. Yeah. In Jesus' name, receive it. And it's not rich just to show off. It's rich for the kingdom. Yeah, this is the house. This is the house of global anointing. Yeah, global impact. It's just the way it is. You will have global impact. It's not something that you will think. You will have it. You just need to tap into the blessing of this house. Don't be inspired. Get anointed. <laughs>